Hello. Eh, bienvenidos a otro episodio de Casalú Podcast. Hoy con una amiga íntima de Snackshot, Andrea Hernández. <risa> eh, number one reggaeton fan for those who eh, like to say otherwise. <risa> yes, some who would not expect it. <risa> So Super excited to be com here. Comenzamos por ahí, pues. What was your number one artist en, en, en Spotify rap? De eh, sí, very timely. Eh, my number one Spotify rap artist is J. Cole. So, shout out. Shout out a J. Shout Cole. out a J. Cole. Number one fan aquí. <laughs> <laughs> que le llegue. Esto, todo, todo este debate empieza porque there were doubts. <laughs> Y Andrea la like reggaeton <laughs> or not. <laughs> Me vieron muy americanizada porque Snapchat es en inglés, pues, tal vez. Chao. Correcto. <laughs> Done. Pero <laughs> that was proven completely, utterly wrong cuando su number one artist fue nada más y nada menos que Jay Cortez. <laughs> ¿Y número uno de canción? Mami chula, tu figura. <laughs> Exacto. Así Jacob, es. papá. <laughs> reggaeton y casa, luz. Y Andrea, mande la mano. Welcome to the most Latin episode yet. De pana. Por lo menos para los gringos. Bueno, sí, bueno. For yo, American friends. Y hablando de eso, yo todavía vivo en Latinoamérica. Conste. Cuenta, so that, that, echa that, el cuento. That could make it the most Latino podcast pues we sí, have. Because todo. everybody's Latino, sí, but they all live in the U.S. Claro. Sí. Verdad. Más que nada, ¿sí aquí en la, o en New York? Yo sigo en la madre tierra, en Honduras. En Honduras. País que me dio nacer. Entonces tú, si arrancamos por ahí, estás en Honduras y un día decides, voy a arrancar este proyecto. No, ¿cuál fue la trayectoria O sea, real? siendo cualquier trayectoria latina que es, eh, pasó la pandemia, estaba comi mi comiendo mierda, unemployed, porque así pasó con todo el mundo. Más en mi país que estábamos viviendo una narcodictadura, eh, todo estaba cerrado y es donde me vi con la situation de, ok, I have to do something que no me limite de, o sea, where I'm from y que no sea algo que me limite physically, porque no podía ni viajar o sea, hasta nuestro aeropuerto estaba cerrado entonces Snackshot, el concepto en sí empieza de que, ok tengo toda esta expertise por a decade working in PR, haciendo brand, brand strategy, research y cómo aplico eso como que algo que siento que it's not something que I've seen before que hay un niche que hay un gap donde pueda yo cubrir. Y me acuerdo que yo lo hice intencional de que, ok, voy a hacer esto, porque that's literally like do or die. Pues, o sea, si me sale esto, pues qué bien, y me resolví. Y si no, pues I'm fucked, y veo qué más. Entonces, a lot of people don't really know that, de que fue como que actually it wasn't como que just, oh, let me just do this as a hobby. <laughs> fue actually something que era como que the world dealt me shit. Ca casualmente, I was turning 30. If you ever want to expedite una crisis existencial, turn 30 during a pandemic in a third world country. <laughs> <laughs> Salud por eso. <laughs> Cheers to that. Que deli. Ay, mi favorito. Casalú Limón. Lo más deli. Y, ok, cuéntanos. Ahí, porque dices que tenías una experiencia antes en brand building y digamos que antes de entrar en Snapshot. ¿Cuál fue esa experiencia? ¿Estudiaste acá? ¿Estudiaste en Honduras? Sí, estudié, pues, estudié en Boston. Eh, o sea, I worked really hard para poder entrar a, a una college en Estados Unidos, obviamente con gran sacrificio de mis papás, que también vienen de como humble beginnings, y todo fue siempre como que cuando la gente ve como que I don't tolerate a lot of BS, es porque a mí me enseñaron desde chiquita de que todo el mundo come, nada es gratis, y hay que buscar cómo hacerle. Entonces, sí, o sea, I worked really hard. Fui a Northeastern, estudié business, marketing, communications. O sea, literalmente fue double major, eh, minor. Yo me tomaba mis summer classes, hacía todo lo que podía, hacía todas las internships que me o sea, todas las oportunidades que me vinieran. Y así empezó todo. Yo, como que, obviamente, as a very extroverted person, siento que mi talento siempre fue en <laughs> como que la labia, lo de socializar, y me acuerdo que yo quería estudiar fashion y mi papá me decía, no te va a poner pan en la mesa. Entonces dije, bueno, what's the next best thing? PR, marketing. 
Entonces, así empezó todo. Y entonces, cuando est estaba estudiando marketing, me acuerdo cuando estaba en mis clases de advertising, que yo decía, wow, ok, ok, nos están enseñando a manipular a la gente. Ok, is this my villain origin story? O sea, literalmente me están diciendo qué color hace que la gente se sienta así de esta manera. Y no sé, entonces cuando es como que when you're looking at how the sausage is made, ¿verdad? Como que es como que te da un disgust. Entonces, bueno, ni modo, o sea, I, that was my career, that's what I interned in. Eh, como que trabajé en diferentes, como que era crisis communication, en otro era como que luxury, PR, hasta trabajé haciendo PR como que para como que celebrities, per se, y social media y todo. Entonces, no sé, eso fue como que what I became mi experiencia, pues entonces... <risa> ¿Cómo pasas de ahí a, digamos que a regresar a Honduras? Pues, o sea, después de cuando no tenés más permisos, te tenés que ir. Pero creo que hay mucha gente, inclusive aquí en nuestro grupo, como por ejemplo nuestros amigos puertorriqueños, que a lo mejor no experimentan esa realidad. Sí. I mean, los gringos por lo menos con Honduras no bromean. So, you know, when you have to leave, you have to leave. Y me acuerdo, I was even dating un gringo. That didn't turn out well. <risa> uh -huh. Pero, I mean, las probamos de todas, pues. Pero al final, pues, ni modo. O sea, todo pasa por alguna razón. Y lo más funny de eso es que regresé a Honduras. Y estando en Honduras es donde empecé una compañía que es con very successful. In, que se ha vuelto como una cosa tan in international que... La gente no me cree, pues hay veces cuando yo les digo, no, estoy en Honduras, y me dicen, no, de verdad, o sea, ¿de dónde sos? Y yo, I'm not based in New York. La gente a veces dice, ok, pero estás en Austin. Y yo, no, ah, pero estás en Miami. Y yo, no, estoy en Honduras. Entonces, it's become the funniest thing, y creo que es como que un big tell de como mi vida, cómo se dio, de que hay veces a mí mucho me da pena decir que era de Honduras, o siempre queriendo hablar agringado más que, el, o sea, que a mí no me acuerdo, a mí me daba pena que se me notara un acento porque yo me sentía de menos. Más como que, o sea, siendo de Centroamérica, Honduras, we tend to have a very bad connotation in the news. Eso es lo que la gente siempre sabe. I did experience discrimination very early on. No solo a mí, con mi familia y todo. Entonces, por eso te digo como que I think it's very funny y ironic. Este como que, ah, lo que te apenas es ahora lo que te, te sale bien. I just think it's really funny. That's how life works. <laughs> That's great. I was always curious on from Honduras, from not being, let's call it in the scene, how do you, what's a superpower to find the brands? Because we, <laughs> to this day, we have no fucking clue how you found <laughs> Casalu and you found it <laughs> early. very early on. To say to the least. 2021. No, like... Summer 2021. Keg. Keg. Like, Andrea found... And, and, put, and we didn't hear from her. We For heard the from first someone lunch else. party ever. Literally the friend, first party ever. Ever. <laughs> How did that it even It was 30 get people in a hands? boat. It was 30 people in a boat. That was the party. Like, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't have known about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> As the co-founder of the company. See, well, I think it's really funny because I, a lot of people ask me that. It's like, ooh, what's your superpower and I think it's not being in the U.S. and not having that como como que I like to call it un circle jerk de que estás en tu <laughs> bubble yo siempre o sea más o sea teniendo que regresar a Honduras siempre era como que oh my god I'm eager to learn more no me quería conformar sabiendo que en Honduras pues o sea ten, we tend to confirm pues porque no hay de más pues y uno a veces se conforma de que Ay, que el gobierno es una mierda. Ay, puta, no tengo luz. O sea, cosas así. That's real life. Pero yo siempre tuve como que, ok, siempre quiero mantenerme al, al rayo de que nobody can say de que porque vengo a Honduras, I don't know shit. Entonces, I was always doing my research, always with my curiosity. I like to say como que I always was curious. Siempre me gustó el research. Y como que, even on my spare time, como que I would, cuando viajaba, viajaba y venía, and I was like, uh, estoy... Eh, visitar una tiendita que me pareció interesante uh, that's very interesting como están rebranding eh, como que cosas como non-alcoholic making it sexier blah 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 entonces a mí I feel like the curiosity has never stopped and if you have that te da el advantage de que you're always eager to learn como un underdog y eso me lo dijo también una persona que es very successful 
eh, Emmett Shine, que tiene un montón de good, like, successful companies, él fue el que hizo Jinlane Media, que fue el que branded him, her, Sweet Green, todas mm. estas compañías successful. And he didn't go to college, now his business is a Harvard Business School study case. And he always said, like, if you keep the hunger, como que that's always going to be your moat. Y I think that's what has always been my favorable thing, es que a mí, yo no me conformo. Entonces, I always have to be looking, okay, what's next? Okay, I'm starting to have an inkling this. Okay, let me go prove my thesis or prove my theory. And it's going and taking time to do research. So <laughs> that's one of the reasons how I came across Casa Luca cuando estaba haciendo mi issue de RTDs. Y that's how I came across you guys, and that's how I kept tabs on Casa Luca. Same thing happened with a lot of brands that they're like, how the fuck did, like, there's a brand called Ruby Hibiscus. A lot of people don't know that they started as a purple drink. Y ahora son rojos. And they're like, how the fuck? Like, we, they are still using these, like, old Snapple bottles to mm. do their, their, bot, like, their sampling. And I found them when they were doing that. So, I don't know. I guess it's my superpower in a sense. A hundred percent is the superpower. But <laughs> tip all the brands, you find them. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? I mean, like, it, yeah. The, to, to us was extremely mind-blowing that that you found it especially after that party that party was in a very tight circle very tight circle it was like, all people we knew it was all friends we knew like venezolano uh, yeah yeah everybody everybody venezuelan like it was to us it was very shocking that you are able to kind of see to see it and keep tabs on it and like porque la forma en que nos enteramos es ah uno, she un mes después does she know the story no, I don't know the story. Do you how know do how we, we how found out about you? No. We didn't know it's not actually ex existed. Uh -huh. Bro, we are down with COVID. Yeah. Un mes después <laughs> del keg party. Okay. Or oh that in initial keg party. But <laughs> después there were a lot of different situations. Y Ricardo y yo estamos enfermos. Gustavo le había dado también y se fue. Y quedamos Ricardo y yo solos aquí en Miami. Y vemos que entró una orden de Casalú a la página web, que en ese momento nosotros realmente, legalmente, nosotros no podemos vender Casalú. <laughs> o sea, no estamos en retailer, no tenemos no, un distribuidor, no tenemos we had nada. A, we had just a fake website that we were like, <laughs> if we prove demand on social and people click on it and they buy it, then we're onto something. It was a fake we website. It, fake con website. un fake design amarillo, que ni siquiera es el que tenemos ahorita. Ni, not even close to the first oh one that God, came I out. I remember one, though, that they look like gold. Exacto, super gold, like, uh -huh. feeling. Y That's so funny. Ah, ha, 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 ya, ya. No sabía que ese era su taster. <laughs> Literal, no, oh, que salud en lata no existía. Risa. That's when we, here's the thing. We were in the Startup Accelerator. Uh -huh. In that Startup Accelerator is five companies in a cohort. Most of the companies are tech companies. Mm -hmm. All these people had, like, betas. Some of them had paying clients, and we're, like, <laughs> we were in, on our weekly updates. We were talking about branding and mm, shit like that. We're like, vision, we gotta Latino do something culture, now. Like people are like, are oh you gonna God. sell something? Or? Yeah, like, what are you like? What are, are you gonna be talking about this all the time and not sell anything? Like, where's your product? Where's your? And we're like desperate. And we're like, all right, I guess we gotta prove demand through social. And we started the tropicalization. Remember, we yeah. curated music and we stuff. We started curating because the vision was always okay. We really believe Casalu is gonna be the next Red Bull. Y we've always behaved that way. So, from the beginning, it was like, okay, until we actually have the brand, the drink, and everything, let's start curating reggaeton and, like, up-and-coming artists. And we actually had some up-and-comers who shit. liked and comment. Uh, we we actually, know them now, too. We, we actually had J Valen, uh, like, one of our pictures. And because I would feature, at the end of the week, what was, like, the favorite song for, for the team. And so, uh, we had everything from Gendry, all the way up to Balvin, who actually liked one of the pictures. E, anyway, that's when we then decide, okay, how do we validate this? Spin off a fake page. <laughs> Someone's going to click it and try to buy it. Let's validate the price. And it was like, I don't know, $15. I don't even remember. Right. E, freaking like a month after we're actually in Miami <laughs> that we have Oops. moved to like... <laughs> Oops. Uh, <laughs> it, it gets leaked on Snapchat. Freaking Tyler 
at bfgpartners.com. The fuck's Tyler? <laughs> buys and purchases an order, and we're like with COVID oh down, like, God. and then we see it's like, oh shit. Oh my God. And then we're looking at what is this BFG Partners thing? VC out of Colorado. <laughs> like, dude, a VC bought this. Shit. And Ricardo is like all oh, feeling bad, like literally like taking some because he needed to take some to get better. <laughs> he, I <laughs> call this guy. Doesn't pick up. Oh, my God. Man, call him again. It's a Monday. I remember this because I was like, it's a Monday. He's probably in partner meeting because every VC is partner, partners meeting on Mondays. And he picks up. Hey, what's up? And my area code is from North Carolina, so he's probably not putting two and two together. And I said, hey, are you Tyler? I saw you bought something on the website. That doesn't exist. Like, I got to refund. Yeah, I did not know this. What? Yeah. I got to refund you your money. Oh, my God. Refund you your money. And how the fuck did you find us? And he's like, well, at Snack Shot. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> like these two Venezuelans in the middle of Miami, just like, it's not Proof that what? I do drive sales. <laughs> True. It's <Snacks> next what? <laughs> uh, yeah, this newsletter and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, okay, but how about for yeah. whatever? And he's like, yeah, sure. I, I was just looking at the space and this looked cool and I bought it. And then that's when we start searching like, fuck, snack shot, like online. <laughs> and we find it at, like, it's a... It, it, at that point, I guess it was Substack where where you had it. It you was probably a still newsletter. It. Yeah. Well, it's it, so was funny. A, it was a newsletter, and I remember the quote saying like, "Let it to Miami to start a rum seltzer company or something like that." Yeah. Casa Lu and a picture of the cat. <laughs> I remember because it, like, it was Casa separated from Lu. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Ooh, yeah. Andrea, you're <laughs> one of them. Andrea. Sabes que, you know what? But I you didn't just, know better then. I didn't know better because I didn't know you guys. I just assumed. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, everybody, it's funny that people don't click. And the funny thing is now that people are calling it the Lou. The Lou. It comes okay. back. Which, yeah, it worked. <laughs> What's up with the Lou? Wow, I just got called out on my own that's shit. But that's how we found out. Well, that's how we found shot. out we would have never known well it's so funny because like that's the reason why i feel like snack has become such a coveted space is because that's the kind of visibility you get right it's like so many people subscribe that's like you don't even know like oh like i have so many brands that have been like oh i just landed my dream retailer because they found me on snack shot so like i feel like was, um, Latina, como que i feel like those things to me matter a lot because you know, it's personal. It's like, how do I lend visibility to emerging founders and small brands that, you know, don't have the resources or like most of the things out there are pay to play. So how do I give them a leg up? Right. Claro. Like that's very Latino. O sea, como te ayudo. Y como, o sea, una de las preguntas que yo tengo es, okay, one thing is to find brands which can be done, but there that's very different from knowing or understanding or creating a hypothesis of right. which of these friends are which of these brands are actually gonna mean anything well that's a funny thing porque in todos los newsletters of snapshot there's always this disclaimer que te dice share with your friends and let them know that predicting trends is this new, new astrology right it's supposed to be <laughs> a joke of like that's science is that it's a hypothesis that you try to prove or not and that's what I do. I try to go. I like to tell people that when I do research, I like to, you know, pull the yarn. Where is it like where is it leading? Where is the thread leading? And is it like a shift in behavior? Is it a generational change? Where is these are these things coming from that can allow me to say, okay, is it just a trend or is it not founded in anything? Is it just like a TikTok hype, whatever? So I think, again, it's just you trying to prove yourself in a way where it's like, but with actual facts and like really trying to, I always say, I try to disprove what I'm saying. Like, I'm always like, oh, I'm wrong. A hundred percent. This can't be true. This is ridiculous. And, you know, when I was saying like, oh my God, adaptogen, like that's fucking insane. Quien puta está comprando 
like all these Palo Santo waters. But and lo and behold, I'm the joke here because that's still a thing. So to that point, right? Like then, what has Naksha been very right about, and what has Naksha been very wrong about? Yeah, hundred uh, percent wrong. When I was like, the adaptogen thing is just commodification of wellness. This is nobody's gonna buy this. Like I'm like, you know, I guess that's, I don't live in the U.S., so like I'm like. This is ridiculous. Like, why would I pay a premium for, you know, water that's telling me that it's going to give me calm and relaxation and $6 a can? It's like, I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to be getting tongued down by the Dalai Lama once I'm <laughs> done with it. So, like, what the fuck? Like, it's bullshit. But, you know, it has had a huge, like, boom in the last two years, ever since I wrote about it. And it's interesting because you see that it's because the new generations, the Gen Z, they're all about like mental health and wellness. And they see these beverages as sort of like emotional support systems. So like, not that I was wrong, because I predicted it. I was like, oh my God, this is about to like take off, but I think it's ridiculous. So I think that was something that I was very surprised to be like, oh my God, I thought this was just all parody. This can't couldn't have been serious. And lo and behold, you can now find these drinks in Walmart and Target. Um, and then I think my most famous accurate predictions have been the boom of RTDs, the hibiscus is the new matcha, which was like, whoa, that like two years later, the New York Times was calling it the ingredient of the year. Um, the espresso martini return, that that was something that I did very early in 2020. That's one of the, the articles that got me my first New York Times quote, which was like, they're like, how the fuck did you know? And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of, it was so funny because like I was doing these things before Snackshot was Snackshot. So I was just doing these things on my own and I was just tweeting about it. Right. And then it was just like also seeing that people were interested in learning more about it. So um, I feel like also the rise, I knew Sotol was going to be like a big thing and then boom, the next year, you know, Le Lenny, Kravitz. Lenny Kravitz is doing his fucking Noche Luna thing. So I think I have had a lot of predictions that have, come true that people now you know make that joke that i'm like an oracle and i hate that because it's like sometimes it's self-fulfilling prophecy right like it's not like i'm vuelta mercado o sea, mm -hmm. like <laughs> i mean i wish that i had you know his setups and you his, can dress like him i mean yeah for sure i'd love a cape <laughs> um and it's so funny because when i when i was starting snackshot there was this producer from NBC that reached out to me and they're like would you like to be like on TV to make a segment on food trends? And I was like, sure. I thought I was just going to be like, you know, like normal, like, oh, th they had a whole thing where like they were, they called me foodie fortune teller. It was so funny. They had smoke, they had crystal balls. And then they're like, where are jewel totes? Literally, you can Google it. Like, holy shit. Like, uh, snack shot at Hollywood. Oh my God. Yeah. You should put a clip on it. It's so, there's, I've made three. I, there was one when I did it with Mario Lopez. So Mario, I'm talking about sex snacks with Mario Lopez. It's fucking hilarious. But yeah, it was at Oxus Hollywood. And I remember I was so proud because it was like, I had just started Snack Shot. I'm like, oh my God, people give a shit. And I just remember like, I was like, yeah, I'm based in Honduras. And like saying that on like TV and knowing that that was going to be like in prime, like US TV, like that was like one of my top moments where I was just like, well, this is pretty cool. <laughs> like, That's awesome. like, this is so funny. And like, they, they were like, yeah, you can say whatever you want. Like, like we, we just want you here for, for, and I think that was one of the things that also helped me prove like, oh, you know, this is not just something that was like all VCs or just like food and, and beverage industry people that I was actually reaching more of a mainstream audience. Que quisiera aprender de que putas es un adaptogen y que es un tropic y, Tell it to me like I'm five years old. And so I think Snackshot has done a really good job at making these trends digestible. And that's where in like this popularity has come from. Because trust me, when I was like three months in and I was like in fucking Honduras and I was getting like, uh, I remember the first message. I was like, holy shit. Me mando un email, the head of culinary at Starbucks. And I remember that was like my first, oh my God, this shit's gone beyond meals right <laughs> because like that was who i was like forcing to subscribe and i remember <laughs> getting a message saying like hi andrea i'm such a huge fan of your newsletter and i was like what the fuck like how did they even get to you know to know about you know snackshot and i think 
I think it's been incredible to see how it has permeated, you know, even cultures. Like, I have people from Japan that'll text me like, oh, you know, like, I love this. I saw this in my, you know, grocery store. People from Philippines, people from all these different countries around the world that I'm like, wow, the, the way that I have been able to build something that can, again, be digestible for any culture, any language. It's pretty cool. What are, do you have a way right now to, like, are you searching for some of these things, for some of these strengths, or have you reached the point where it's like coming to you? I don't like to get PR pitches. I actually say don't do that, and I tell brands don't give me PR pitches. Um, I will sometimes when I have such a bad, some brands will p pitch me so terribly, and I come from PR. So I will get out of my way and be like, this is horrible, just so you know don't do this emails like I would reward it like this like I literally will correct people's emails and then be like I hope that I don't have to you know send this to your <laughs> like the person that's hiring you to do this because it's actually pretty bad um, I think it's the P the art of PR has kind of really gone down I think it's because everybody thinks that they're entitled to have um, attention in other even if it's like a like beyond pay to play in some sort of like barter system, I think I don't like, I don't, no me, o sea, no me hace, no me da placer que me lo den. Yo, a mí me gusta encontrar algo y decir, uy, claro que, y, y the, the funniest thing is like the people who I find, they're so small. Of course, they're not going to have a PR team. So whenever I'm getting pitched, I already know. I'm like, oh, come on. I already know this is <laughs> not an emerging brand. And it's not to say that it's their fault, you know, but. I think that if you've read Snackshot and you know about Snackshot, I have said that from the beginning, I don't want to do PR. I don't like PR. Um, I think that we can build something better. A mí me gusta decir, creemos estructuras win-win. So how does everybody win in this situation? But when you're putting things where it's like pay to play for emerging brands, when they're already having all these expenses as a small baby brand, then it's, it's something that's like, it's zero sum. Y no me gusta zero sum. Siento que viviendo en Honduras, like I've experienced, like, hay muchas cosas donde las estructuras desde un principio no benefician a las personas, entonces las tienen siempre de perder. Entonces, I know this may not be like the UN or I'm trying to solve human poverty or whatever, pero en my way, como que I have tried to build Snackshot, no por mi bien propio, o sea, like, like I, I could be making a lot more money if I wanted to because like I, ha I know that I can, like the way that I do is that I try to say this isn't, this is, and I learned it from my father. He always said, de que, que bien hace el dinero si no lo usas para el bien de otros. And my dad has always been a really amazing example of someone who took nothing and turned it into something that was a, a humble business that has helped a lot of people, a lot of families, and so I always, saw that as like, wow, I really love that idealism, but it's not an extreme idealism. Entonces, with Snackshot, with people do think that I'm like some weirdo that doesn't do that, it's not personal, it's just I really am trying to find how do we use this platform to the benefit of the people that need it the most. Hmm. I mean, speechle cool. speechless. <laughs> It's, no, it's no, great, I and I think drum. I think it <laughs> I think it's it's I I I believe that those things like we we as a generation have the like a different thought of we're not limited by the fact that okay a business has to be just a business and like we we're st we're starting to explore other ways to do things, uh, and so I think that completely kind of aligns to 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 what we are. Um, that when you said you know the th what's the thrill do you do you want to be right are you chasing being right <laughs> or or where where does that oh, sa ta hablando de como que you 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 don't want the pr people to tell you like you want to get it but i feel like i feel like it's fun to explore i feel like when you pitch it to me you make me lose the fun of like ooh i found something cool i feel like i like to think of curation and I write this about I, I mean, I've written about this I say this a lot I think of curation as a way to take you where no algorithm has before I feel like we're exposed to so many things instantly constantly 
that I am trying to find ways to give more friction. So for example, whenever I do, you know, guides or whenever I write these pieces, like I actively search for a necessary friction. You don't need to know, like when people are like, when is your guide coming out? And I'll say like, well, you don't need to know when it's coming out. Just know it's coming out. You don't know to know what brands I'm going to put out there. Like I'm not trying to actively promote this except for when it comes out, you enjoy it. And it's the discovery of like some people still remember the things. I had someone that messaged me and said, I discovered this brand back in 2021 because of you. And I have been recommending to my friends ever since. And I'm like, damn, that's why we do it. Like when you have this, like you, you have this little wait time, you have a little buffer. I think you appreciate it. You understand it more. You, it's a, it's a better way to like build a relationship with a brand. than let's like, I'm like doom scrolling. I'm like, oh yeah, another brand, another brand, another brand. Like, I feel like we should be adding more necessary friction. Mm -hmm. And I do think that on the other hand, curation helps remove unnecessary friction, which is noise, which is again, PR. It's like, <laughs> Pina, I just, uh, this brand just released a pineapple flavor for summer. This brand just released a, who gives a shit? I don't like, I don't give a shit about that. That's not the kind of thing that I'm looking for. I'm looking for, you know, things that, again, brands that I feel like, oh, you're doing something different. You're building in a space, you know, for a generation that hasn't really been looked into. So that to me is interesting. <laughs> not your yeah. pumpkin spice flavor. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Align. L listen to that. To that. To that feedback for the PR <laughs> for the PR write up that we're doing. Yeah, we're, we're having Align do our PR. <laughs> who's also our podcast? Who's also our copywriter? Yeah. Who's also our unofficial PR PR person? He's like, if they can do it, <laughs> anyone can. Yeah. How was our How was our pitch for the clothing? I mean, I think I the think email because you you sent her an email, no. I think it was more like... Because we had an angle. Our, no, uh, the pitch el, story wasn't just about Casa Luz, you know, how to build brand. El, el angle has... De nuestro caso, okay, I don't know if it's accurate or not. I'll be curious because I think it, it would be useful for other brands and, and ourselves. But it'll, it, from what I remember was like... First of all, obviously you know what Casa Luz is, but second of all, es como que we really believe this we don't want to do merch. We wanted to do an actual clothing line. Mm -hmm. And the brand stands for doing more what most would do, which is just slap a logo or an interpretation yeah. of a logo on a t-shirt. And this was like, no, we want to, every piece has a very deep story behind it. So I mean, I'm a full believer in that because that's why I people keep telling me to do merch and I haven't done merch. I'm like, I don't, I don't think that... And, I, and then if I ever do merch, I do want to do, like, special one-off things. Like, I have a few ideas of things that I want to do, but that resonated with me because I understand, again, the necessary friction of, like, you don't have to have, you know, the Casa Lu shirt, whatever. Instead, like, you're basically weaving a story with each piece that you're putting out there that also helps reinforce the brand that you already have. And I think not every brand can do that, but there's there's some that have dealt it well. I feel like Campari, they don't really do merch, but they'll do the occasional fashion drop. And I think they did one last year that I, I posted about that. It was like, I don't know what, it was like some British brand, I think. And I was like, damn, that's so sexy. Like, I don't even drink Campari, but I'm like, ugh, that was pretty hot. So, yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's, um, there's, hay um, validez en claro. what you're doing yeah. Yeah, en, para, yo creo que para nosotros el 90% del tiempo it feels like we're swimming against the current it's like we're crazy because you're still still new too I feel like branding is compounding effort of you are reinforcing yes. reinforcing a good example is Gia I know it's like non-alcoholic but when they started people were mocking them all the time like oh I'm overpriced juice and why would I buy a $40 bottle mm -hmm. of this and then with everything that they've done whether it's like this puzzle that they've dropped or they've done collaborations with these beautiful glassware or they do like um this like Nutella spread everything everything they do is telling a story of Mediterranean aperitif culture 
And it doesn't have to be necessarily that it's branded Gia, right? It doesn't even say Gia on anything that they put out. Like the glassware is not like it says Gia anywhere. Right. But it's just the design and the curated aesthetic and vibe that, again, it's compounding that message of everything revolves around this. You know, for you, it's a whole like tropical escape of, you know, us. You know, I think I think what, what to me is so special is that I, I think Casalu resonates with me more than ever because you don't have that youth reference when it comes to a Latin hood. I think it always feels como que una herida que te vuelves a rascar y entonces yeah. sangra. Y entonces como que it's very painful because youth in Latin, like, o sea, la, la juventud de Latinoamérica is always about, like, pain. pain. De ahí sale, o sea, todas las cosas bellas que ves, el arte, o sea, la música, etc. Entonces siento como que siempre estamos como que en, como que en el proceso de sangrado y no cicatrizado. Entonces, lo que nosotros a veces aspiramos en la, y que lo ves en las películas y todo son tropes de cosas viejas, de cosas pasadas, de cómo eran los latinos antes. Claro. Entonces eso es lo que a mí me como que da más como que sometimes como como nostalgia de pucha, o sea, how is it that no hemos tenido como que un sentiment de aspire to that was, I mean, I'm not young anymore, I'm 33, pero que I couldn't have enjoyed it in the moment. Claro, porque es el giving them, it's giving the youth, o sea, we call it the new generation of Latinos. But it's not because they're the new generation, necessarily only. It's because we also didn't have it. Come on, we didn't have a brand that was global or that could be global that represented us as the youth. Mm -hmm. uh, that was brewing. Y no pasó sino hasta. De hecho, yo creo que el reggaeton juega un papel importantísimo acá, simplemente porque es un género at the right time, at the right place, eh, que en su momento lo hubiera podido haber hecho la salsa o X, el merengue, pero en este caso fue el reggaetón porque, ok, fue un momento en que las comunicaciones se abrieron, social media open, like, technology allowed for S this to Spotify be a global. Happened. Spotify, streaming services, downloading, uh -huh, yeah, That's actually very important porque te hace sentir como que tienes community through, ok, a hundred thousand people are están escuchando la misma canción que yo latina. Cien por ciento. Oh, and the other thing, honestly, is the industry did not give a shit about Latin American CD sales because they were not relevant. They're, they're small. Not, they were they were too small. They were not big enough. You know, buying a ten dollar CD here is whatever. Buying a ten dollar CD in Latin America is much harder. So there was la industria de la como de la de la música pirata, los discos rayados, el Lime Wire. But then Spotify happens and suddenly like they can monetize these people as much as everybody else. And then those streams start to matter. And then suddenly, okay. No, but there's this feeling Fate. that I'm in the communion. No, no, the claro. okay. o sea, I feel I like we're all communing to my Mami Chula song. Cuando veo que me dicen you're in the top 3% of people mm. listening to the song. Yo, oh my God. Mira, yo, o sea. yo fui recientemente Fade had este, um, a showcase acá. Eh, durante los billboards y the way they did ticketing fue Spotify said okay what's the top top one percent listeners in the Miami area <laughs> y dieron 500 tickets I was not in there but <laughs> I got a VIP through a connection <laughs> eh, oh my god y pero creo que más importante que eso o sea al final creo que la realidad también es la inmigración dejó que una generación se comenzará a construir aquí en este país específicamente eh, y ellos escuchan lo que sus padres escucharon y lo que la generación más joven escuchaba y they happen to be on Spotify now y ahí están nuestros artistas representando una cultura que ya es más global que no solo local que incluye del norte al sur obviamente el reggaetón es extremadamente fuerte y ahora estamos viendo por ejemplo los corridos mexicanos y Ajá, otros subgéneros exacto. Que, que se están volviendo más globo que tenés mucha razón con eso pero también eso es lo que me gusta de Casalú porque kind of encompasses that de que como que it is kind of culture in the making 
que eso es lo que no nos enseñaron nosotros porque no nos enseñaron como que que tu cultura es cigarros que tu cultura es ron que tu cultura es tequila no sé mm. qué which is something that's like already instilled legacy y siento que como que Culture in the making. Culturally, uh, culture in the making. I'm really good at this. That might be my <laughs> tagline. <laughs> you know, that's that's very important because Gao Gao always <laughs> says like the new generation of Latinas, and I always on my mind. It's como a struggle, como que. Como que <laughs> what does that fucking mean, no? Pero pero creo que lo que estás diciendo es que es que culture kind of never stops. Mm -hmm. So it's like we thought it did. Uh, para nosotros era como que este es el legado de los latinos. Uh -huh. Salsa, dominó uh -huh. y, y tabaco. O sea... Sí. Eh, sí, tabaco, sí tabaco, tabaco y ron. Tabaco, y whisky, si tabaco, tabaco, ron, whisky. Como que this is where... Uh -huh. aquí, ahí this termina, ajá, ahí termina, ahí termina. Pero actually it's, it's not like that. And I think that's, that's much easier to explain. Es como que our sí, culture is evolving and now it's being shaped by uh, basically a combination of America of a Latino growing in American culture. Pues, sí, it's like a combination of, of... Por eso te digo como que that's one of the things that I love porque mucha gente siempre dice como que ay, que la diáspora, no sé qué. Pero la verdad es como que that whole diáspora también es culture in the making. And I think, I think our generation está más open a, porque... Es por que ejemplo, eso, pero eso somos nosotros. Sí, Esa diáspora somos nosotros. También. Somos, porque yo todavía vivo allá. Uh -huh. Pero I get it. I get it. Pero, ¿sabes lo que me parece bien interesante? Que como nosotros como latinos también nos ponemos demasiado de que nadie puede, así como decís, slippery slope, como que quién puede hacer esto y quién no puede hacer esto. Por ejemplo, o sea, I, that's why I'm telling you que me encanta Casalú como este sort of vehicle de, ok, todo es, it's, it's, it's kind of like a culture should be alive, pero that culture no es un legado muerto. Correct. Que es lo que te dicen. O sea, ¿qué tengo yo que ver con la gente que estaba? O sea, los en Honduras siempre dicen que los, los cigarros hondureños, ¿qué? Okay. Yo veo y los videos y la gente ahí armando, yo como que, ok, dude, but that, is that really my culture? Porque yo no crecí con esas plantas enrollando el tabaco, o sea, that was not my culture. Que yo ni fumo. O sea, exacto. No, no. Entonces, por, eso, que, por eso es que siento como lo de, lo de tropicalization y todo eso, como que siento que es muy... Que, o sea, hasta hablando con la, la gente que te he presentado, siempre lo presento como que es bien interesante este concepto de cómo le introducimos a una rapidly changing demographic que tiene de todo, ¿verdad? O sea, estás expuesto a todo. Entonces, ¿cómo introducís eso? Como que, what is culture? Y culture is alive. Culture es una cosa que se mueve, breathes, eats, de todo. Y que aún así mantenga esa raíz. Por eso, I'm looking at it right now, and I'm like, that's... Solo el casalú con las raíces, that to me, again. Una combinación de lo nuevo y lo, y lo, que, es, lo que viene. And I always like to tell people that, de que this is, this is what it should look like cuando una nueva legacy brand in the making, tal vez, or, or always evolving, así como le, le dan el always evolving al José Cuervo, al Ron Drugal, y todas esas, ¿cuántos años llevan a mi mierda? La misma cosa. Not to say that they're not doing a good job, pero es como que, ok, who gives a shit a las 20 años? O sea, ¿quién putas está comprando una botella no sé cuántos dólares? O sea, nosotros somos esto, la gente que se va a comprar su $3 seltzer, que se va a comprar su six pack, that's the youth latino. Y, o sea, no ha habido una marca que, que ha hecho como que, hey, soy para vos, ¿me entendés? Como que, porque es, siempre está el trope de que, ¿cuáles son las marcas que es como que lo más barato? Que siempre es como que low quality, whatever. Y ustedes han kind of taken everything, de como que, this isn't, just because it's affordable, it shouldn't have to be low quality. Que yo me, que, me acuerdo que mi primera vez probando a Casa Luz me quedé como que, o sea, no sabía mierda, ¿sabe, Deli? Mm -hmm. Porque la mayoría de los seltzers que yo había probado, pero sí que no tomaba seltzers, porque era como que no, me va a saber como un horrible aftertaste o algo, y solo me acuerdo como me, me, como que fue como una little light, que dije, oh my God, nunca pensé que un seltzer pudiera saber tan deli, como si yo me hubiera hecho el trago. So, not to be, como que, by the way, I rarely do compliments así, pero, I mean, I'm living it with you guys. O sea, los he visto crecer, obviamente, desde de, de que you didn't even have a good, like, an actual store. Right. Entonces, I'm very invested y, y me gustaría como que poder make it understandable of people, like, kind of how I see what you guys are doing. Y como que de poder como que hablarlo 
diaspora versus someone like me que si en Latinoamérica I would love to see Casa Lu en Latinoamérica no, no. es que we that, would love that, to that, too we will that's part exactly. of the plan right since the beginning más bien era como ese es el bridge para nosotros que es ok nosotros entendimos Ricardo Gustavo y yo por ejemplo tuvimos la suerte de estudiar en los Estados Unidos y que después nos pudiéramos quedar nosotros nos vinimos, yo, yo por ejemplo me vine a los 17 años a los Estados Unidos y ahí comienza esa trayectoria. Sin embargo, familias que están afuera, que conectan, o sea, que sus top stream artists son, de hecho nos educan a nosotros. Mora, por ejemplo, es top en Venezuela y mis primas y ese tipo de cosas. Y es como que ok, cool, como que we're doing stuff with Mora coincidentally for different reasons. Y nos educa gente que no está necesariamente dentro de los Estados Unidos. Y al mismo tiempo está el, I'm too Latino to be American, I'm too American to be Latino here. Y es, ok, ¿cómo conectamos esos subsegmentos? Y es, at the end of the day, it's global culture in the making. Y como que, ¿cómo somos parte de eso? Uh, es como la, o sea, Latinoamérica, pero en un gradient. Y o entonces, sea, eso es lo que me gusta, de que cuando vos tenés esa, ese gra de gradient, de que, bueno, no importa que sea muy verde porque todavía soy verde. I could still be a little bit green. Claro. Entonces siento que that's a good way to describe lo que ustedes hacen de poner la cultura. Again, cómo lo, cómo lo, o sea, cómo enfocas que it's still alive, que seas one or the other, it's still valid. Como que ese mensaje que ustedes siempre hacen, como que it's like... I don't know, it's... it's, 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 it's ahorita estoy como que pensando como que wow... Uh, I'm actually thinking, like, maybe I should rewrite a couple of things, pero eh, como que me estoy dando cuenta como que that's kind of like how, you, how todo lo que ustedes hacen tiene que ver con que ese sense of belonging, whether you're diaspora, whether you're still in Latin America, y como que verse in the middle, pues, como que we're still all the Creo same. Creo que a veces we don't push it enough uh, for fear, this is implicit, and again, uh, so, solo lo estoy pensando ahorita, pero fear of being como que put in a box, porque creo que otra de las cosas que nosotros hemos pensado, eso es a nivel generacional, que creo que es clave. Nosotros sí creemos que representamos ese culture in the making. Sin embargo, parte de culture in the making es previous generations rethinking how they think things y compartiendo. O sea, us sharing with our grandparents, Casa Lu es una avenida para hacer eso. El dominó es una avenida para hacer eso. Y es parte de nuestra marca. Y... Yo, por ejemplo, a nivel personal he visto como que mis padres como han cambiado muchas las cosas que pensaban durante los años siguientes por ver a sus hijos hacer ciertas cosas de una u otra manera y ese, es ese cambio eh, de latinos en, en cierta forma y, y Casalú, yo lo veo como es, es como parte de eso. Sí, ese, el domino es como un ejemplo perfecto de eso, creo. Que es como un segue ahí para todo, pero todo el mundo... The young kids use it their own way y los viejos y como que it's a way to connect with everybody. Y creo que Casalú también como que se presta para eso. It's not the natural thing. Como que un, un, tú le dices a un viejo tuyo que se toma un ron en una lata and they're gonna look at you ugly. Pero después lo prueban y es como que... I get it. Es como que... Oh, respect. Casalú. Yeah, when identity is fluid, we keep you lubricated. <laughs> Something like that. I'm going to work on it. That's funny. Yo, real yeah. quick. Uh, I was going to tell you, because, um, like, one of the things that I connected with, because mm -hmm. uh, when, when how we met was I actually interviewed them first, because I found them at, at a Latin festival, a Vida Urbana, and I connected I'm a Latino that was born here, right? And what I liked about them was I felt like they were catering to, like, not the 50-50 Latino, but, like, almost, like, the 200%. Like the 100% Latino, 100%, 100 Latino born here. So that's like, and even in what they do, like they're very, like I tell them all the time, I'm like, you guys are like super Latino, but also like super like Cali skater vibes. Like you guys are like catering to both at the same time. And I feel like that's what makes it special is that you guys are like, yeah, like just catering to, to both well, sides. And, and also like you, you were speaking about like the, the culture that it's, it's like kind of changing. And I feel like, Th especially this generation doesn't have like a uh, an identity per se with like i don't know if i'm explaining it right but like it, it, the, the, since it's because it's always changing like 
you guys are also changing with it and you guys are evolving with it. And I feel like that's the, the special thing that sets you guys apart. Well, I, I think, and I think all those things come from, from we also, even growing up in Latin America, even doing all these things, like Gabriel went to an and one thing, you know, right. like I went, I, like we all saw Disney Channel Cartoon Network, like we were influenced by a ton of things happening in the U.S., that kind of like connected with what we were living in Latin America at that time. So I feel like we have that kind of like new culture in the making is part of that. It's like feeding from others. It's like, this is happening to us now. This is, I'm seeing this like social media kind of expanded the realm of I think what it's, influences. Yeah. Me. But I think it's special for people like us that are like Latinos, obviously maybe other cultures that have experience, I guess like, you know, being part of multiple things at once so mm -hmm. like latinos latin america itself is not like something where it's like oh we're just homogenous across correct and i think in america mm -hmm. people are s like in the u.s in particular i feel like they're so um very myopic and that's one of the things that i always bring back to snack shot when people ask me like what's your advantage i'm like my advantage is that i'm not looking at the world around my own lens that i'm always trying to figure out oh with what's happening here is it similarly to what's happening in europe what's happening in asia and i think for us the reason why we're so fluid and that the reason why you can be like an alive being and that you can have this gradient of culture is because that's how we were born. <laughs> we were born to adapt. And I think the the only thing that I feel like it's for me as someone who still lives in Honduras is that you you are fighting this en un tronco que está bien, pero así con las raíces bien ensartadas y no se quiere mover. Sure. And no matter how you try to position new things, it's harder because you're it's still entrenched. But I think when you're able to uproot yourself, entonces de ahí vos pones las raíces, pero they might not be that deep because you know, okay, cuando toca adaptarse, toca adaptarse. And I know this because, you know, my mom in particular, she was a civil rights, like civil rights, civil war refugee that she escaped from Nicaragua to Honduras. Mm. And I remember she was like, I went from having, you know, something to having absolutely nothing. And she always would tell me that in my life, like I always had to learn to adapt. And I think that's very much part of our war-torn, unstable, like again, it's like an open wound, like I was telling you, it's, it's always gonna wound. be an open wound. And I think that's the difference between Latinos pues, que han experimentado estar afuera versus tal vez los que están acá que se ponen como que, okay, eh, a mí me dicen que me tengo que poner, eh, no sé, las botas o, o escuchar no sé qué. Y that's my, again, the legacy religion, the legacy culture o lo que sea que you kind of have to like imbibe. Mm -hmm. Pero I think to conclude this sort of whole conversation, I think that, como te digo, me gusta ver como Casalú como un vehicle, más que nada, como que your guys are basically like not just a beverage, not just a fashion line, you know, como que, okay, anything que se puede translate into what we're doing, que es viviendo, viviendo the legacy in the moment is right now. Right. Porque tal vez tus hijos si tienen, si, si le, o sea, si tenemos el privilegio de verlos crecer grandes y que tal vez Casa Luz becomes a legacy brand, then it'll be like, oh, en el 2023, mi papá está sentado, no sé qué, and it's going to be different. And I think I it's think different. that's the cool thing about right now is that we're seeing, you know, a potential legacy brand in the making. I think that's pretty special. So uh, we should we should end on a very cutesy note. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep pushing. Um, I guess we can do a little bit of a, a trip of thoughts. Um, you released State of Beverage. Mm -hmm. Is it State of Beverage today or State? I haven't had time to read it yet. <laughs> so you released State of Beverage today. Uh -huh. What, w w in general terms, what are you seeing in the industry? What are you seeing in CPG, specifically she in she beverage? She gets paid for that, bro. You got to pay for that. <laughs> we're going to pay. We're going to pay no, 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 paywall. No, no. Paywall. Every, every time you say something, it's Patreon. like, Patreon. 
beep. Patriot. No, no, no. But uh, here's this how brand could do beep. This, this is a new beep. <laughs> You're like fuck. censored. This so, sub trend. to the Patreon for the exclusive content. <laughs> <laughs> put, it, put it behind the. Here's how you hook him. You'd be like, link down below. Get your paid annual subscription yeah. to Snack Shop to get. Yes. State of average. Well, <laughs> I'm a paid member, so I'm, I'm going to check it out. You are a paid member, so you got the notification. That's probably why I didn't get it, and I'm asking questions. So. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what it says. Only one <laughs> of us can read it. You cannot, though. <laughs> That's the whole point. I don't ask. <laughs> no, I will say it's, it was very fascinating because I kind of focused on things that como que weren't the tropes, right? Like, I wasn't, I really didn't care about CBD drinks, right? Like, that's like, eh, kind of passe. I was kind of... CBD. Ah, CBD, CBD, pardon. Okay. So for me, it was like very much um, interesting to see nostalgia being yield, like w like wielded as a, as a, como un allure, more so than how I had seen in the past two years. I mean, I've only been doing this for three years, but like it was pretty wild to see how much beverages, whether it's a cocktail recipe, um, for example, tiki cocktails mm -hmm. uh, um, or like just like 80s country club or 80s Acapulco style vibes mm -hmm. are, you know, making a comeback. And I think it's really honestly, it was kind of depressing to do that research because I'm like, oh, my God, we're stuck in a three year loop and we can't get rid of it. And, you know, I think I think people have this also like um They think, oh, yeah, because N.A. is booming, that the uh, cocktail is going down. And I think that's very erroneous. People don't really understand that the boom of N.A. does not necessitate that, you know, people are going to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the opposite. I think it just gives people an option to say, okay, I'm going to switch from my, you know, RTD to uh, an N.A. spritz. Because I don't want to have four. I'd rather have three and then just like have yeah. whatever and replace it. And I think the biggest, the biggest misconception that a lot of people have with this, and that's one of the things that I write about, is that um, the whole NA boom is about them learning what made alcohol sexy in the first place, which is alcohol is a literal depressant, and they sell it to you as if it's an euphoric elixir because they made it sexy. And they made it like, ooh, happy hour associated with, dip, like, literally imagine turning, like, the tables on something that's again a literal depressant and associating with things like happy hour and i think that's the genius of marketing i always say again my villain origin story was in that fucking advertising class where they're teaching you like <laughs> oh this is what they want focus on those like uh needs like their emotional right. needs so i think um besides like the whole like na is gonna boom but that's not gonna detract from alcohol the other Qu one quick question on the na Is, is is the NA, um, do they want, the, what, does the consumer want to taste like alcohol? Yes. Or do the consumer just want it to taste good? Like they what's the difference between NA and soda in the, this So, case? okay. So, ooh, this is actually a really good question because there's a lot of things that are different. So first of all, the whole difference between an NA now versus an NA in what you had in restaurants already, which mm -hmm. was like, I like to say it's a spectrum of the plane, and then on the other side of the spectrum is the overly infantilizing mocktail, mm -hmm. which was, I mean, the virgin daiquiri, claro. the virgin daiquiri, or like pina colada, margarita, whatever. And so I think those two were an extreme, and that's all you had. Now with this new NA, boom, you have, oh, I have bitters and soda in a can, which is like, oh, the phony Negroni that comes in like a little, um, como que aperitif, little cool bottle. And I think um, now you have a lot more options que son non-infantilizing and then that they're not alienating me from the experience. For example, even just the positioning of NA drinks in the menus. Now people like menu, like the people who do the menus or whatever, the restaurants, they're getting smarter and realizing like, ooh, we should put the NA options in the same as the, the ones. Uh -huh. And so people are actually buying $8 cans of, you know, Gia Spritz at a restaurant. They're buying, I heard um, that in Montauk over the summer, there was all these trendy restaurants 
had St. Agrest Agreste's um, Phony Negroni selling for $18 in the menu, the little, the little bottle. I think it retails for $6 a little bottle. And so just so, like just to give you a testament of the ma the brand like the magic of branding and positioning even if it doesn't have alcohol that you have sort of this inclusion effect. I think the 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 majority comes to the fact again non infantilizing include inclusive in the experience of alcohol. Obviously alcohol is such a social lubricant for a millennia that's not going to change from one day to another. But then taste, people are act absolutely not wanting to have sugary, non-alcoholic alternatives. So that's why you have seen the rise of the bitters and soda, the bitter spritz, like the no like the false amaros, the phony Negronis, the phony mezcal Negronis. Everything has to have sort of a bitter profile. The juniper has been an ingredient that has become like super popular in NA because it helps emulate sort of a burn. There's even this... um. That so, so people still want that burn from the alcohol in that sense. That, that it emulates that profile of an alcoholic okay. beverage. Claro. So, you know, claro. ingredients like, like juniper have become popular because of mm. that. It's so funny because this brand Caleño is sort of like wanting to do a version of an N.A. Aguardiente, which I think it's a fuck. I haven't tried it personally. Like, it's a fucking challenge. But <laughs> what I will say is that the funny thing about DNA and I, one of the things I wrote about in the report is that the bottles are not going to last. That's not that's 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 going to fall away. That's going to be bottles. just a trend. Right. I think nobody is fucking buying forty dollars of an NA agave. That's bullshit. What people are doing is, yes, I'm going to buy, you know, a four dollar um, mezcal, phony Negroni, whatever. If I find it or if I buy it online, whatever, maybe I'm at a restaurant and I buy it on that occasion, but I'm not going home and preparing myself a bottle of yeah, yeah, like a, 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 a fake a fake uh, espresso martini. Yeah. Exactly. Like, like imagine making like a fake me like ne Negroni, Negroni or a mezcal. fake. Yeah. I think we have know, one of those bottles. So old fashioned. It's we just have a, a. It's a lot of work. Yeah. We have ritual there. It's a uh -huh, It's a lot of work, but also like. The taste is just not the same, right? Claro. But then, so if if, if this is about just... Yeah, it's hard to... Because understand. remember, a lot of people think that these things are about just sober people, and that's not true. It's about the flex drinkers. So again, I claro. maybe want to opt out of, you know, three calaloos, maybe I want to have two, and maybe I'll substitute it with something else. And so I think that's the biggest misconception is that people think that it's because, like, oh, it's only for people... Like, nobody's going in their house taking their N.A. tequila and doing a fucking N.A. margarita. Who the fuck has the time? They're going to buy it in a can already made. And that's why, you know, when I spoke to so many N.A. retailers over the, like, the summer of this year, they're, like, telling me, they're like, yeah, like, if they don't have a can now, we don't take them because we don't want to have this bottle that doesn't sell of a spirit that people haven't. Because remember that we're talking about training yourself to a new palate profile that you haven't ever tasted. I've never tasted non-alcoholic tequila, so I'm never going to go for the bottle. I'm like, let me try it in a can or, or, or demos first. Because Shit. That's claro. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a very, a very um, I it's guess, insightful. No, thoughtful insight on, on, on NA because I would never have thought of like, okay, after everything is happening on NA, the assumption is, you know, consumers still wants kind of like the taste and, but then bottles are ruled out because then it becomes like you're doing all this effort for not the, but yeah, but not the right reason. It's an educational aspect too. And adoption. That's the whole thing is about adoption. Right. How do, how do I encourage adoption? Give me a little taste. That's how we became so successful. He launched Spritz. And because of spritz, people are familiar with what the bottle would taste like. So right. they, of course, are going to be more inclined with, oh, you have a bottle flavor? Yeah, you just launched another one? Okay. You're like, I'm familiar enough with this to be able to make that purchase. But if you're not familiar with it in the same way that DTC beverage does not fucking work because people are like, why am I going to spend $45 on a six-pack of a fucking drink I've never had before, period. Uh, plus you. shipping. <laughs> Which is sixteen dollars <laughs> and fifty cents. You fucking heard it. <laughs> Any investor who asks. Bro, it's crazy, right? Like that's another part of the conversation. Like 
what's, uh, what's investable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's one of the things. And then, like, another thing, again, that's why I even tweeted about this. I was like, if you are in NA, and if I was an investor, if you are in NA, you don't have a can, I'm not, I'm not looking at the deck. I am so sorry. That's just the reality. You got to speak with right. facts. But then another interesting thing is, like, that misconception that Gen Z isn't drinking. It's like, no, bro, like, they're fucking borging. They're fucking, they're doing the exact same thing as our generation is doing, but they're just doing it in their own manner, which is, like, one of the things I've noticed is that Gen Z really loves personalization. So they're really into, like, the drops mm -hmm. in the powders, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in that, like, space for Gen Z and the, the movement of anti-carbonation which I find very fascinating. Where it's like they don't want bubbles in their drinks. And there's this whole movement of like people defro like frothing actually to decarbonize their drinks. And so it's fascinating. Why why is this happening? I don't know. Maybe it's because, you know, LaCroix and all these like 2010s decade was all about like the carbonated, the seltzer wars and everybody was like having massive bubbles whatever it could be also that a lot of people have now gi issues gastrointestinal issues some people say i can't do fucking bubbles it could be that too and so i just find it really fascinating that gen z is kind of leading the movement of like a non-bubble yeah. rtd which to me as someone who grew up with the whole white claw shit like it's just really interesting that you would have it plus plus just that actually why people put bubbles is that it actually opens up like the little pores in your tongues and it makes taste uh it makes you absorb taste better like the flavors and stuff better so that's why people have resorted to carbonation in the past so yeah. another thing that i'm fascinated by but it's definitely one of the feedbacks we get apparently we have less car carbonation than most people and we yeah. get that feedback a lot. It's like, oh, what I like about Casa Lu is that it's not as carbonated. Obviously, we're not falling in the non-carbonation realm. Like, I'm tell them, yo, it's less carbs, dog. Huh? Less ca tell them less carbs. Just <laughs> 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 right? shorten it to less carbs. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, that's a that's an interesting point. Michaela, my girlfriend, loves the maracuya, and she lets it sit, so it loses almost all. The tell her to use a milk frother that's the key um, you just put a little bit for a little bit and that we'll removes the bottle as an add-on <laughs> yeah. you should do a TikTok about it's, it yeah it's interesting like how do you as a brand position yourself as here's the carbonated and here's the non-carbonated like can you even well that's like another thing i actually write about it's about the range right like one of the things that i also think it's really fascinating is to see brands come out with a range so it could be a range of sugars so there's brands that are coming out with six packs that have well you pick how much sugar you want there's we'll have two that are zero sugar two that are three and two that are five grams of sugar there's ones that are doing it for alcohol so there's a, a brand called system seltzers that does zero percent and they do i don't know five percent and the other one's like nine percent so i think that's something that i find that there's a lot of opportunity it's like why don't you give people options in like oh do i want it to be extra bubbly do i not want it to be bubbly do i want it to be completely still and that personalization i think is really big with the younger generations and i think that's why drink talk is huge like it's insane like these kids will like grab drinks and then they're adding some syrups they, these fucking kids have the fucking Starbucks bottle syrups in their homes. And, and I'm like, what the also. fuck are you doing? Okay, let's try this out. <laughs> drink talk. Hashtag drink talk. I just think it's so fucking funny. You know, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I could have never imagined myself like going out and literally buying these like big ass. It's, 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 yeah. it's crazy to witness. But the, the levels thing, we've seen it with even levels of alcohol. Sure. With well, the system, the system. Well, that's yeah. what I was saying, yeah. But the funny thing is, like, if you look at soda, like, soda, you're actually used to kind of having three, four versions of Coca-Cola. But non-incarbonation is, like, specifically, yeah, like, different It would be profiles. levels of sugar, but, like, in, but you know like different. Sugar. Like, yeah. yeah, I have, I drink Coke Zero. I drink Coca-Cola, yeah. like, regular well, no, Coke. I drink. For the first time, right, like, it was it Pepsi? That is, like, the, f the center piece of their launch for this year with their new rerun which i don't mm. know who did that shit but it was a uh, pepsi zero the gold <laughs> one yeah the gold one no I have black the black one there's like black there's gold there's blue there's mm -hmm. i mean yeah big white. beverage has done it before but i feel like interesting things carbonation 
hasn't really been played much in and then like the sugar levels for sure but then like things that's like oh do you want this to be bitter do you want this to be sweeter i feel like that would be really interesting to see you know some brand come out with like a very i like to say it's like inclusive drinking where it's like oh you can have a zero beer you can have a mild beer and you can have like the strongest beer and nobody's really doing that when it's like well that's also the like design of how actually someone already does that but they do it with bottles three spirits they have your initial drink that's supposed to put you in a mood to socialize Mm -hmm. then they have the livener which is supposed to like keep you in the mood and then they have the nightcap which is supposed to unwind you that's uh I, the, the first time I saw something like that. There was a bar called Idlewild in Charlotte, North Carolina, where they would you come in. It's kind of like omakase style. They call it omakase style, and it's you don't choose your drink. You just say kind of what you like, and then they'll be like, okay, we're gonna get Make you kind of like prepped up or how we call it tropical first, <laughs> and then you get like an actual drink, and then you're gonna have like your big boozy th- drink, and then you gotta get the fuck out and that was like like a whole layout of how I you I feel like that's a whole drink sommelier kind of thing too. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot out there. I mean, that's the thing. Like I was I w- I thought that's this was going to be shorter than it was, but this whole report came out and I'm like, "Oh my, I had a lot to say." But then there's a lot <laughs> of things happening that I'm just like, "Whoa, it's like across alcohol, it's across NA, it's you know, the plant-based and the milks and the different kinds of like yuzu has been fucking popping man even as demand like it can't Metal. demand like it's like the like the supply can't meet the demand and then things like because mezcal and you know tequila have put a strain on demand sotol has saw the opportunity of like oh fuck you guys like there's a lot of me so i'm gonna start getting out there you know i think that it's so interesting to see sort of these like game of thrones it's of ingredients the thing stuff. is that it's just to- <laughs> at least in our industry it's just tough to break into retail right every state is different but that's and a u.s who, thing who thinks differently yeah it's a u.s thing it's a u.s um, thing for sure big four distributors for liquor and then you have the yeah. beer guys which is sold separate but you know once you get in the big beverage bed that's when you can really really make something of it that you just have to make a make yourself appealing to them and then let them deal with the distribution (laughs) combine forces (laughs) well because you if you can't beat them join them you You need to just get yourself a (laughs) snack daddy once you have your snack daddy then you're talking that's exactly correct so so actually my job guys uh i have become a groomer of casa lu for potential snack daddies that's my unofficial title oh yeah <laughs> i'm the groomer. madame the madame of casa lu. I'll, I'll take a snack daddy how, how, do you, day. how do you introduce casa lu <laughs> whenever what i'm talking to yeah. other people what's the first what do you say what do you say um i say like huh i'm wondering how i introduced it to this person I don't. S- I have never used the term rent ball. I said like. Yeah, that's very like internal. I feel like when I introduce you first to the people of Snack Daddy Corp, which I won't say <laughs> live, um, but I was like, I I didn't compare it because I didn't have anything to compare. But I did say like, it feels like it is. They're very in tune with like culture and the youth and that it feels organic and it feels authentic and i think that's a lot of what these big beverage companies even with the new brands that they put out there that they don't have so those were the i used it as organic that it was authentic that it wasn't like overly produced that it wasn't relying on tropes and i don't know again i i can't compare you who am i going to compare you to fucking captain morgan dude <laughs> like no. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> please don't do that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, to I don't Bacardi. Really, like, I don't, don't really don't think. Don't compare to Bacardi. Like, there's anything. Or yeah, Captain like, Morgan. if of course. And so, um, but yeah, for more information, um, <laughs> you can call one eight hundred Snack Daddy. I am their official madam. I'm the one who seeks out which companies need to get groomed. <laughs> Indeed. Snack mommy. <laughs> that's, well, that's Andre, thank you. 
Thank no, you for coming. Oh my God, yes. I had to do this. It was like in my to-do list for this, this year. Is, this will be part one. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we'll do part two. <laughs> and part two in New York. Well, we're all playing street basketball. <laughs> and street basketball and, and dominoes in the background. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds, no, it thank sounds you right. to the Casa Lu boys for having me. Um, and shout out to the pending, you know, Lu Spritz. Lu Spritz. <laughs> We're going to work on some stuff. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>